Despite being the homeworld of one of the founding member species of the United Federation of Planets, Andoria did not make an on-screen appearance until the fourth season of Star Trek Enterprise, 37 years after the first canonical appearance of the planet's native species. The moon of a gas giant planet, this cold and inhospitable world somehow manages to support two different, yet closely related, sapient species, the Andorians and the Enar. Andorians are bipedal humanoids possessing a similar average height and weight to humans. Their skin color varies across several shades of blue and teal, but they always have straight white hair. A pair of articulated antennae protrude from their head and provide them with various additional sensory inputs, including, but not limited to, the ability to sense minute variations in air pressure and magnetic fields. Enar possess nearly identical traits to Andorians, except that their skin color ranges from very pale blue to hues of white, and their highly developed telepathic abilities make up for their near total optical blindness. Andorians make up the bulk of the moon's small population at approximately 1.8 billion, compared to only 4.1 million Enar. Both species live underground in caves and ancient lava tubes that snake thousands of kilometers through the moon's crust and cryosphere, with their cities clustered in areas of high geothermal activity, which provide them with both warmth and energy for their technological civilization. On the surface, temperatures rarely rise above the freezing point of water and have been known to drop well below negative 80 degrees Celsius, resulting in a thick layer of ice that envelops the majority of the moon's surface, covering the rocky land masses and the high salinity oceans, which themselves cover around 85% of the subsurface crust. Andoria is a frozen terrestrial 79% the size of Earth, and given its reported surface gravity of approximately 1 g, it has a calculated mass of 0.63 Earth masses and an extremely high mean density of 6.96 grams per cubic centimeter. According to some sources, it has a tidally locked spin orbital period of around 30 hours and seems to orbit its parent planet with a moderate inclination, based on the fact that its parent's rings can be seen from its surface. It is one of two major moons orbiting the gas giant planet Andor. Unfortunately, no astrophysical nor orbital data exist for the other moon, but based on its visual depiction, it is likely the larger of the two major moons and lies exterior to Andoria's orbit, potentially inducing an eccentricity in said orbit that drives Andoria's tidal heating and keeps it geologically active. It is very possible that this other moon has been colonized by the Andorians, but little data exists to corroborate this assumption. Similarly, no data exists for the moon's parent planet Andor, leaving only visual information on which to base an analysis. Given its blue coloration and the presence of icy rings, it is likely a methane-rich ice giant residing in the outer region of the planetary system. If it is constructed realistically, it would likely have a minimum estimated mass four times that of Jupiter and an estimated radius of 0.8 Jupiter radii. It is said to be the eighth planet orbiting the star Procyon A, which lies approximately 11.46 light-years from Sol. The Procyon system is a binary star system consisting of a late-stage main-sequence F5 white star and a spectral type DQZ white dwarf stellar remnant. The two stars orbit one another with a period of 40.84 years and an eccentricity of 0.4, which brings them as close to one another as 8.9 astronomical units and as far apart as 21 AU. Andor's parent star Procyon A has a mass of approximately 1.45 solar masses and a luminosity 7.05 times greater than the Sun. Its companion white dwarf has a mass of 0.6 solar masses and a luminosity 2,000 times lower than the Sun's. No data exists for any of the other planets located in the system. So how does Andoria measure up as a science fiction planet? If Andoria was a terrestrial planet somewhere near the habitable zone, having a mean density of nearly 7 grams per cubic centimeter would be considered high, but still plausible. But for it to be the frozen moon of a Jovian planet, that is just too high. Cold Jovian moons typically have mean densities below 2 grams per cubic centimeter, and even the densest of them never exceed 4. 
Some might suggest that this indicates that Andoria formed as a high-density terrestrial planet before being captured by Andor, but the presence of another moon of similar mass around Andor makes this explanation all but impossible. Negative one point. No data exists for the orbit of Andoria around Andor, nor Andor around Procyon A, so zero points. Very little is stated about Andoria's atmosphere or climate beyond it being cold and possessing an approximately Earth-like composition and pressure. However, I feel it is unlikely that it could maintain such an atmosphere due to its apparent lack of a carbon cycle. On Earth, the carbon dioxide that is released into the atmosphere through animal respiration, volcanic activity, and industrial emissions is slowly removed and processed back through Earth's crust by the activity of photosynthetic life, dissolution into the oceans, and the weathering and erosion of surface rocks. But Andoria does not appear to possess large quantities of photosynthetic life, and the thick ice covering its land masses prevent them from being eroded. This leaves only Andoria's equatorial ocean to absorb the excess CO2, and this single carbon sink could easily be outpaced by carbon production, which would lead to the ocean becoming saturated with carbonic acid, killing off most, if not all, of the life contained within. Once the ocean cannot hold any more, the carbon dioxide would likely build up in the atmosphere, becoming toxic to animal life and eventually initiating a runaway greenhouse effect. It is possible that Andoria has some natural means of recycling carbon in the environment, but none is indicated. So, negative one point. No data exists for Andoria's parent planet Andor. However, its visual depiction is at least consistent with what would be expected of the eighth planet of such a system, so I'll be generous and give it the point. The Procyon system may have possessed planets up until about 1.3 billion years ago when Procyon B, the at the time primary of the system, ran out of fusible hydrogen, swelled into a red giant, and then shed its outer layers to leave behind a white dwarf. It is very likely that this event destroyed any planets orbiting either of the two stars. But even if some planets survive that cataclysm, Procyon A is now suffering the same fate, transitioning off of the main sequence and into its subgiant phase. As this continues, its size and luminosity will increase, pushing the star's habitable zone farther back into the system. Any planets that orbited within the HZ during Procyon A's main sequence lifespan would have by now lost their oceans and been rendered uninhabitable, and any planets lying near the system's frost line would currently be disintegrating as their ices melt and sublimate. Procyon is a dying star system and has been for over a billion years, making it a terrible choice for a science fiction planet. Negative one point. With a total of negative two points, the moon of Andoria from Star Trek receives an F2 grade. This is a dismal score, and unfortunately is emblematic of Star Trek's tendency to view planets as merely a stage for a performance, rather than a living world in which a story takes place. Thank you for joining me on this planetary analysis. From here, my course is set toward another strange alien world, and I hope you'll join me there. Until then, live long and prosper.